かったね。Yeah, we were just talking about whether these edges of the metal we're seeing are melted. That almost、mm. looks like a dead eye, but you know, wrong era、yeah. for sailing. Yeah, not a dead eye. Can can we zoom back out for a sec? Yeah, coming out.、Um, there's this piece down here. If we could get a better look at, I'm just not sure what it what it is. We might be too close. We are traveling bow to a midship on so, the sorry, port side. Sorry, can I wait one 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 sec? Sorry.、Um, Yeah, Hansa. Like we were wondering, because there's there's really na、uh, small, narrow, like holes along here, but、uh, I don't think it it doesn't look like it's it would be part of an aircraft. I'm not really sure. I can't really see like what it's attached to or what it might have come from. Do you mind circling where you're looking, Mike? Well, I'm looking at this whole thing here. Okay.、Um, Thank you. But can we zoom in on like these holes here? See, I just think that those seams are look very thin and light to be ship construction, but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, it's pretty light. It's, I can't, I couldn't rule an aircraft part out. Yeah, but also can't say what it is. So, well, it's captured, so we can、uh, can show someone later. That looks like a black triangle. Yeah. On the、uh, right side of the screen. Yeah. 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 It's looking silverish. I'm afraid. It looks like a white band. These are not heavy rivets. They're small, no, small fasteners. Close spacing, flush seams. Thinking a potentially a wing or a, or、uh, the body of an aircraft or no? A piece. Okay. Yeah, it would be. A, I, I feel like it would be a piece of the body, if anything. If,、um, but it's obviously flattened and just kind of without context, so it's hard to see. Uh, without someone who knows aviation construction better,、um, I'm not really sure. Right.、Um, no. To our viewers online, just examining a piece of metal along the along the port. Side of the ship, just after the bow, didn't quite look like a piece of ship construction. Some smaller rivets and kind of tighter seams and construction. So just inspecting that as we make our way amidship on、uh, our attempt to wrap up this dive、uh, on the Kaga. All right, we can we can come full wide. I think and that's、okay. we can show this to our colleagues、uh, later on.、All、Thank、right. you guys. Coming wide. Catalina, are we still moving? Yeah, seemingly didn't make much headground headway there.、Uh, yeah, no worries. We're just we're ju this this direction is great. Yeah,、uh, and I mean we're actually only about thirty meters out from the start point. So yeah, that's good. I mean we don't we don't have to wait and pull exactly at whatever time ten.、Um, you know we'll we'll finish this round. We'll see where we are, and I might you know we'll whatever. So、okay. yeah,、yep. I'll just check with Daniel and or Megan. 
Cool. Once we get there. Okay. If you're watching on Nautilus Live or on YouTube, we encourage you to come over to Nautilus Live. You can check out uh, some of the team bios, Same people piece. here on 8 to 12 watch, but also all the expedition team, including those ashore. Hard to say. And um, we will be characterizing the last bit of this port side of the Kaga. Japanese aircraft carrier lost at the Battle of Midway, sunk there. and. Um, surveyed today. It's the third shipwreck dive of the Ala Amoana Kaiuli expedition in Papahanaumokuakea, the fifth dive overall. But we will be out here for a couple more weeks, continuing to dive for some of the nearby seamounts, uh, working with our science team mm -hmm. and being led by Dr. Val, Val Finlayson, who's uh, characterizing some of the geology gathering samples for her study and, and other scientists, geologists study as well. And um, excited for all of those, excited for what the next two weeks will hold. Um, but tonight, thinking of home, uh, thinking of family, thinking of community, mm -hmm. uh, thinking of the legacy of all that this historic battle, this shipwreck, this war, and the period since this war have mm -hmm. left for us and these waters of Papahanaumokuakea. Thanks for tuning in. Stay with us. I think we should be on the sea for another 20 or 30 minutes. And then who knows? Who knows who will stay on and what might happen on the ascent. I just called another move in to keep us moving along. Okay, awesome, thanks. Can we zoom here, Mike? Yeah. Circle. Okay, zooming. Mike and Hans, you might be interested in this insight or comment uh, Very from, much so. from a viewer. It says, uh, I believe you guys just solved the secret the Kaga kept from us naval historians. We've been wondering if the ship was refitted between the attack at Pearl Harbor and Midway, where she went from two supports at the bow to three. And I believe I've just seen the evidence that supports this, and I appreciate it. Awesome. That so, is great to hear. From your fellow marine archaeologists, naval historians, historians. Yeah. Uh, that's great. That's great. That's a, that's a very nice comment. They say thank you all. Thank us all, but especially those of you who are uh, leading our exploration of these vessels for all you're doing. I've got a bit of a runaway zoom happening. Uh -oh. I think i got to go full wide. <laughs> yeah, we can go wide again. Sorry about that. Mind of its own. In the depths, things can take on minds of their own. ROVs, camera zooms. Sometimes Kanaloa just takes over. Trickster. Sometimes they happen at sea level too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's true. Hi, this is Randy from Japan and can you hear me? Yes, Hi, Randy. Randy. Yeah, we hear you. Aloha. Mahalo for calling in. Aloha. Yes. Yeah, uh, I received a question, and it's a kind of big question. I think a lot of people actually wanted to know uh, this, but how can we actually uh, preserve this? It's, it's, I know it's impossible, but what can we do to uh, stop the deterioration, and how long uh, do you think it would take for the kaga to completely uh, collapse. That's and a, oh, good. Yeah. I mean, 
is there any uh, chances that we might uh, bring up some uh, parts of the artifact from Kaga or not? Um, so on, on the second part of the question, no, we, w we won't be taking up any, any part of the wreck. Um, we're not uh, permitted to do that under our operation inside the National Marine Monument. Mm -hmm. Um, as well, we don't have, we're not equipped with an ROV that has an arm anyway, but we, we aren't permitted to do that. Um, as far, as far as the preservation goes, um, I mean, we are seeing corrosion. It's not as bad as, uh, shipwrecks that are at, at Bikini Atoll or in, or in shallow waters, um, like, like in, in the Indo Indonesia area, uh, where, where shallow and warm waters that, that have, uh, access to sunlight and other marine growth. Uh, corrode a lot faster. Um, we're seeing actually a lot of preservation of the wooden decks in places like at the stern. And uh, it, it's too deep here for the organisms that consume wood. So those that might last for forever, uh, for quite some time at least. Um, I don't know the exact amount of time for a shipwreck like this to, to completely corrode and disappear, but it'll probably take hundreds of, hundreds of years. Um, I don't know that there's anything to, I mean, it's in one of the safest places for a shipwreck in the marine environment. It's it's dark, deep, and cold. Um, so I, I think it's in a pretty good state for, for being around for quite some time. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, so if like a Japanese government uh, would like to actually bring something up from this wreck, is is that going to be, uh, how would that might uh, be? Uh, is it possible to do something like that if there's a regret? Because I, I, I believe uh, it's still a property of Japanese uh, government. So if they say they want to raise it, uh, how, how would that going to happen if that's the case? Uh, well, I know that, um, so it's, it's inside the uh, the U.S. National Marine Monument, Papahanaumokuakea, and within uh, the U.S. EEZ. So I, I know that there would be a, a permitting process for, for any dives or access to, to any of the sites just for operating in those waters, um, the protected waters. So I, I, I can't really speak to what those would be. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, those are very uh, interesting questions, Randy. Thank you. You know, if, if something like that was desired or proposed. I mean, it would obviously be a, a separate mission. It's not something that, any, mm -hmm. that, that anything could be done about now. Um, yeah. But from these depths, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it could be quite complicated to um, bring up much at all. Um, mm. But I'm not, I'm not saying it's impossible to do. It just would be a separate mission, a separate discussion uh, about that topic. Randy, Megan and, Megan and Daniel are not in the room at the moment, but we can certainly uh, let them know that, that that question came through from you, and, and we appreciate, we appreciate okay. you asking. Mm. And, Daniel's uh, actually just plugging in right now oh. in the studio. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, uh, some of the people that I know and through my SN, uh, uh, SNS service people ask me several uh, questions, and they, they are concerned about you know what what would happen like 50 years from now and also if that's the case why not we raise uh, anything and preserve it so i know it's very difficult question but you know some of the experts might uh, know better than me answering that question yeah and and uh, i'd also say you know that one of the objectives of this mission is to conduct baseline uh characterization and documentation so that we have the data and the evidence to show what the wreck looks like now, so that if we were to come back sometime later, we can we can look at changes, we can look at the speed of corrosion, we'll be able to document certain places and how they look over time. So so we'll be able to assess better upon repeat return visits uh, how fast things are, are deteriorating. Yeah, yeah. This, I don't think there's a, a very large database on on how World War II shipwrecks fall apart in different environments. Actually, I know that. Folks have been interested in that question and SCAPA flow with the number of wrecks there for sunken military craft. I know that the USS Arizona 
in Pearl Harbor with the Park Service in conjunction with various other laboratories like um, um, Eglin Air Force Base and University of Nebraska have studied the corrosion process and the deterioration process. I can tell you from personal experience, having dived recreationally on some sunken military craft that were set down as artificial reefs on Oahu, that they look fine for a long time and then at some point they begin to collapse. But I would, of course, initially agree with Mike that this is one of the best environments that a complex warship of this size could be in. A very cold, dark environment uh, with relatively low dissolved oxygen content and also protected by depth from anyone wanting to, you know, possibly do any, any, any uh, illegal removal of anything and protected within the boundaries of a national monument and potentially will be protected within a sanctuary which has more long-lasting uh, protections as a, under the Congressional Act for National Marine Sanctuaries. No matter what, Randy, uh, I imagine there's a lot of paperwork <laughs> a lot of paper, a lot of paperwork well, we, involved. Yeah, we, uh, we excel at that. <laughs> but we appreciate you and your colleagues so much, um, not only for those questions, but for your participation and leadership in this uh, historic effort and um, representing so well the, the servicemen, the sailors who, uh, family members of many in your community who serve so Mahalo nui, arigato. Look how light that framing is. You know, that's, here. that's not any kind of framing or ladder I'd expect as part of ship construction. Yeah. This is just a mess here, huh? Yeah. I mean, we're still pretty close to where some of the bomb damage was, right? Yeah. I mean, the bomb damage was kind of across the whole thing, but yeah, True. there, there yeah. were bombs that were dropped in this area. Okay. Can we uh, zoom in? Sure thing. And again, I think I can't quite tell the scale of this. Right, and it's it's been it's pretty lengthy, so Yeah. Yeah. Is that all wiring on the right side of the screen? Yeah, at first I thought it was white pine needles, but looks obviously like net. That's where's not that line? <laughs> looks like net. Yeah. Well it I don't know what that is. Looks like barbed wire. Wow. Yeah, almost like a fencing. Uh. If you're just now joining us and have not been joining us for the past four or five days, you're going to want to tune in to Nautilus live on social media channels and on YouTube for highlights um, of these incredible, historic, humbling uh, dives um, in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. This is uh, the third vessel, Kaga, um, after diving the Akagi, and before that the USS Yorktown, three aircraft carriers sunk in the historic battle of Midway. We do still have viewers tuning in from around the world. Um, we're so thankful for the power of telepresence, allowing you to join us as part of the exploration team. So Mike, um, according to HiPAC, it looks like we're at about where we started. So yeah, what if you, would can you... we zoom out and look at the deck edge? I'm not... Coming out. This is assuming I can even remember this morning, but hey. You're doing great, Mike. <laughs> Thanks. Hmm. Yeah, it's full wide. And if you can turn to the right and look down the length of the wreck a little. Are we still in the middle of a move? No, we're not. All right. And if we could look up or pan down the length of the wreck. Mm 
Wow. I mean, yeah, I think we came down in, in, in the range of something like this and we thought it was, you know, just, we didn't know which part, which deck it was yet. You know, we it could have been flight deck, it could have been hangar deck. It turns out it's severely below all of those. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is familiar because it was, it was kind of, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, that the indent there, that's where we came down on the left. So, yeah, um, this is ship construction. Yeah, so it's ship Obviously. construction. It's, um, but I remember it being pretty, um, flat and uh, featureless at the very beginning as we started moving um, aft. So, yeah, I think that's a complete circumnavigation. Well done, team. Anything else you want to see? I, I remember that the rest of this being pretty... There, there are no upper decks to go to. Yeah. I mean, the only other thing to do would be to kind of move, come up a bit and move midline move for mid -line, a, a view yeah. downwards. And up in a spot to depart. Yeah, we yeah we could do that, and then and then lift up from there. Sure. It would give us a new view. Yeah. yeah. So we could just hop over this little hump here. Okay. You would just go directly in, and then we'll go forward from yeah. there. If yeah. It, okay. If it's safe. I think it should be. I don't believe. Uh, we want to go directly into the middle line, and then move up a little bit. Yeah. Or yes, aft. Uh, let's see. Yeah, only if it's safe and if anything happens, Mike suggested it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you say, oh, okay. Yeah. Bridge now. Could we move one zero meters at bearing zero four zero? Zero, zero four zero. Yeah, thank you. Three incredibly important and historic shipwrecks in uh, just over three days, four days. Team, well done. I'm uh, so inspired and impressed by all of you and all the rest of the team that's not able to listen in right now, hopefully getting some rest, but uh, what what a what an accomplishment and uh, what a humbling humbling experience to, to bear witness to. So yeah, it's been a pretty intense few days. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I want to just take a, a couple minutes here to just acknowledge our, our, our sponsors in particular. NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research for not only uh, sponsoring this mission but also opening their doors at NOAA headquarters uh, to staff and support and exploration command center has been absolutely crucial over the last 96 hours while we uh, did some really remarkable exploration. Uh, so thank you and, and also to all the participants who uh, spent long hours at the exploration command center. So thank you to Search Inc. Navy History and Heritage Command, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, Nauticus Inc., Asulmar, International Midway Foundation, and then also a few other participants who called in over these last 96 hours, uh, particularly the IRC Heritage Foundation, Teiko University, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, and Tokai University. And those were just uh, the people that called in in the chat. We had uh, many dozens of people that uh, participated in chat, uh, helping guide uh, interpretations and chiming in with comments. Uh, thank you very much for, for all your contributions to this mission. Mahalo, Daniel, and mahalo to you. Daniel Wagner, Megan Cook, expedition leaders, the whole team on the bridge, captain, captain and all the all the officers, um, incredible leadership again. Uh, all, I can't believe that, 96 hours, 100, basically 100 hours of, of exploration over the last few days. We know the internet wants more, always <laughs> does, but, uh, but uh, we are so thankful to, that you joined us for, um, Mahina and I have been saying, it truly was the privilege of a lifetime. I wonder if those are events related to the uh, smokestack. Mahalo, Daniel and Daniel. 
We're in the area. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't have pulled this off without our uh, expedition leads. Yeah, we're hollowing the lead, guys. Mahalo Nui for all of our Alaka'i, our leaders, our Kumu, our teachers on uh, Nautilus, on board Nautilus, and then on shore, and all of the efforts um, across our com different communities around the world, the different entities represented here um, in the, the past hundred hours of archaeological exploration, deep sea exploration. Um, as we venture into the Kai'uli, the depths of the sacred realm of Pole, of our darkness as Kanako Ivi, um, the sacred space of Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Mon Monument that's so heavily protected and preserved. Um, so, you know, our future generations are the keiki of tomorrow, the children of tomorrow, our students of the future can have this space, have this sacred space to explore, to learn. Um, Mahalo Nui, thank you. Kapu na keiki, eh? always remember. Painted on the, on the back of Hokuleo, all of these expeditions, explorations for the future generations. Gonna learn from this incredible library of knowledge, from this conversation, from this experience. And uh, so thankful Nautilus can, can bring that live into so many classrooms and, uh, and online for so many people to learn along with us. But, um, Excited to go back home uh, in a few weeks and, and share this with more of our ohana, more of our friends mm -hmm. uh, back in Hawaii. So are we looking up the middle now? Is this yeah, what this is? Yeah, okay. we're looking at. Okay. Do we want to go like 20 meters that way maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And we'll see where that takes us. Okay. We can always start pulling up while we're still doing a okay. move anyway, right? Mike's now just going for a joyride, uh, <laughs> a celebratory joyride, but uh, seeing what we can see on the, what's left of, uh, of on the main deck of the Kaga. Som somber joyride. Uh, of course, yep. of course. Uh, we will be uh, departing the bottom shortly, and uh, we'll still be here, take some questions and conversation. We have people online still asking some great questions. Folks who are hoping to see some evidence of planes, for example, uh, you know, curious uh, why we didn't likely see much of that, but Hans or Mike, not sure if you want to answer that one, but that's uh, one of the questions coming through. Well, so a lot of the, a lot of the aircraft um, that were part of this battle were not on the aircraft carriers when they were bombed, they were up in the air. And so they would have either had to land on Hiryu or ditch in the ocean. Uh, to be picked up, hopefully, in many cases, by uh, other other vessels nearby. Um, so, so there weren't necessarily a lot of planes on here to be to sink with the ship, and the, uh, the ones that did would have probably been either blown off in the explosion or on the hangar deck, which burned, and and so a lot of those aluminum parts would have melted. Um, so, I, I don't think there's much there was much chance at any of these. Uh, wrecks for aircraft to have gone down with the uh, with the carrier because they, they were either in the air or had had blown off really. Yeah. I think I think that the most likely was was on USS Yorktown and if we'd had um, you know the, the the maneuverability and the the ROV setup with Little Herc where we could have taken a little more care to poke our head into the open uh, hangar deck. We might have been able to see some some wreckage of some, um, but given that it rolled over and all of the the, the hangar bay doors were open, uh, they probably would have fallen out when it sank anyway. Yeah. Um, so I, I never really thought that there was a a, a very high chance of, of aircraft on these sites. Thank you for that. But there is, I will say, given that there is a massive aerial battle and a lot of aerial man maneuvering throughout this entire area. You know, there's, it's never a zero chance that we might stumble across one while exploring elsewhere. It's not a high chance, but it's not. It's <laughs> not never zero. no chance. Not Great, zero. Greater so, than zero. So it's greater than zero. zero. So it's some, you know, it is, but, but seriously, it is something to keep an eye out for. Um, Nautilus has stumbled across a World War II aircraft once before. It was on Halloween uh, off the oh, coast wow. of Italy. 
and uh, Steve Carey, uh, a, a professor at uh, University of Rhode Island, a volcanologist, was telling a story about, um, or something about his father, and they were asking about um, if we'd ever found an aircraft. And at that moment, Brennan Phillips, the ROV pilot, saw what looked like an aircraft in the scanning sonar and was like, oh my God. That's and then wild. moments later, a World War II aircraft appeared in the ROV footage. Wow. Um, like, like moments after they just asked the question on mm -hmm. Halloween day, they were very spooked out by that. Oh, so, you know, it, it does happen. Oh yeah, we've, we've seen about 40 or 50 aircraft underwater yeah. around the main Hawaiian islands. And when you look at the inventory, just between 1922 or so and 1954, there are at least 1,700 aircraft, naval oh, wow. aircraft splashed in around the Hawaiian Islands. You know, and so one of the one of the big um, research questions for kind of the entire landscape of the Midway Battle, you know, we're looking at the at the the big stuff. Like these wrecks are um, obviously the largest parts of, of it uh, in terms of uh, mass uh, and they you know they were found th with AUV survey but there are all those aircraft out there that either were shot down or crashed or ditched or, or were on carriers and fell off and so an entire landscape it's what it's possibly the largest battlefield ever uh, uh, and so you know one thing that that is is uh, you know in our minds to do someday is a, like just a full AUV landscape survey and, and then spot dive you know and, and investigate all of these smaller debris, the, you know, the, the decks that, that were blown off, the aircraft, because um, because there is a much bigger story than than just these um, capital ships that, that were sunk as well, because the, the battle spanned over 100 miles. Thank you for that context. Uh, this whole corner of Papahanaumokuakeo. Yeah, it um, really is. Really saw saw that uh, historic, and that actually extends all the way battle. to Midway Island too, because the yeah. you know aircraft were shot down on the way over there too. That's right. Some people are curious about the condition of the bow and the stern. Uh, from my observations and from what I heard, a good portion of the stern is missing, including the lettering yes, that would have been on the side. Yeah, we estimated about 12 meters of the stern, including the name, were missing. And then the bow looked also to be pretty buried, both in the sediment and also fairly severely damaged. Well, the bow was actually yeah. fairly well intact, but yeah, the, the, the prow had, had buried itself in the sediment, so we weren't able to see if there's any writing on the side or the, uh, the, the chrysanthemum crest that we were able to see on Akagi, yeah. um, which was unfortunate. It, but the, the bow was actually in a pretty decent condition relative to the rest of the ship. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It looks a little bit like a sedimented sponge at the bottom of the screen, yeah. but I'm not 100% on that. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it does. It's a it could also just be like a piece of metal that's sticking up. Unclear. Yeah, I see what you're looking at, though. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen a couple of things that look a little bit like sponges from afar, but I think there is something that corrodes on these that is kind of white. That's what yeah, I've more zoom? been noticing. Yeah, I got a little bit. Front row, know you're uh, you're busy in these final moments with operational things, controlling, doing a great job controlling uh, Atalanta and coordinating with the bridge and the video. But we'd welcome any uh, any thoughts uh, about the last wow, almost 100 hours spent exploring these wrecks. If there's anything you want to share, we'd love to listen. I can say that um, you know once you kind of get through the tense moments of navigating and you know look back <laughs> yeah. on what we've been doing and it really it's pretty incredible to you know look at the big picture of this and kind of what was just mentioned the fact that we saw that emblem on the front of the Akagi that that really stood out for me that was really an incredible sight so all right can we zoom out again? Catalina amazing amazing to watch you uh, deal with both those stressful moments and all of the attention to detail that you have to give and communicating and coordinating with the with the bridge and with our ROV pilots and the whole team. And then also just thank you for your spectacular insight and, uh, and sharing throughout, um, doing your job so well and, and going beyond. We appreciate it. Thank you. 
Mahalo, Catalina. Mahalo, Dui. Thank you, guys. We made about 15 meters progress um, aft towards the stern. Do we want to continue for a little bit more? Yeah, let's just do another 10. Okay. Thanks. It's like um, it's like when you ask a surfer, you want to catch a wave? Yeah, just one more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just one more. When you ask a marine archaeologist, you want to go 10 more meters? Yeah, you, yeah. Never, you never just know what you haven't 10. seen yet. That's <laughs> right. Correct, yeah. It's a poignant moment. Yeah. It really is. These have been some remarkable and unforgettable and, and sometimes difficult glimpses of the past. Um, yeah, really amazing. It's a, it's a, um Certainly a, I'm not even sure what the word is, but it's a powerful thing to see how much destruction, you know, can be wrought on something. Um, you know, in, I, I think- In a day. In a day, and I think, and you know, this is just a glimpse at some of those moments. And uh, it's important to, you know, study them and remember them because you know, we're trying to hope that such instances don't have to happen again. Um, you know, and, and fortunately, the, the U.S. and Japan have become great allies out of this. You know, that's not how every conflict ends. So, you know, you know, a, a, an alliance rose out of the ashes of, of things that happened 80 years ago, which is which is nice to see. Agreed. Ew. Ew. I'm not sure I felt uh, thought that I would feel this way, but um, it does feel like uh, just want a couple more minutes. Yeah. So thought I would be ready, but um, as I see us sometimes moving a little bit further away, I'm just find myself thinking, no, not yet. Just one more. Just one more. I've heard that, yeah.
All right, well, um, pilots and navigator, when you guys are ready and in a position that's safe, uh, we can begin our ascent. Copy that. As we go, a massive mahalo to you, Mike, and to you, Hans, for leading us and bringing so much of your knowledge and expertise. We know for most of these last hundred hours, you have been in the van sharing your ideas and guiding us. Oh my so God, did you just say hundred hours? Already. Holy crap. Yep. <laughs> wow, I didn't think of it like that. All right, coming up. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Get some rest, my friend. Echo all of that. Well, the shipwreck's still in sight, so we're going to take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll give you a few minutes. It's like, I'm not ready. <laughs> Probably won't even be able to fall asleep, right? Yeah, i got to have some time to process everything that we've seen and learned about these wrecks mm -hmm. over the last few days. Yeah, it's going to... Fortunately, I can be distracted with pretty corals for a few days, and then, <laughs> I, and then I can uh, deal with that later. Aloha e, kaga. Aloha e. Watching it slowly fade out of sonar. Mm. All right. Upon this ascent, we actually invited one of our other crew members. She's making her way up here now. But we're just going to offer a mele, an oli of gratitude, of mahalo, of thanks. Um, just to kind of close out this space and as you've heard from our crew members here in the control van, it's been a very emotional and intense uh, past couple of days as we dove down on three different archaeological uh, wreck sites from World War II, from the Battle of Midway in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. All right, uh, well, you want to rouse the cannon? We want to get this wound on here well. So I'll take over. You go find Ken. Let him know we're coming up. Mm. And then can we bring the drum up on the big screen? Yeah, I can do. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Well, yeah, thank you, Hans. I think that's this is the critical part of the drone right here. So I think I want Mike down there. I can let the bridge know we're going to be begin bringing bringing it up. Um, is it going to be at about four hour ascent? Is that what it? Yeah. Approximately. We want to make sure it winds on here well because this is sure. the deepest, the last deep dive we're doing. So yeah, I want to come down a bit here because uh, I want this part of the wrap to be right.
The name of this expedition is Ala Omoana Kai Uli, and we're located. Yeah. We're currently Dang in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, and Uli can also mean a spectrum of blue, a um, various shades of blue. So we're going to now offer an Oli Mahalo, a song of gratitude of thanks. Mahalo nui e kanaloa, mahalo e mahina, malia, kokui, the whole crew. I know we all entered this space with uh, deep uh, ha, ha ha so much aloha, so much respect and reverence, and uh, deep gratitude. Mahalo is more than just thank you. It's a, it's a deeply felt gratitude um, that we share with all, all things that this uh, this experience mahalo yeah. Yeah. it's just so appropriate for the space and what has been revealed to us and as we were mentoring on, on one of our earlier ship to shore interactions um, we have such a slim weather window and we've even you know, have said that the ocean truly decides, Kanaloa truly decides the work that we're able to do with the time that we're given here. And so to kind of have these dives, to go into these sacred waters, to dive to these depths where such tragedy has taken place, um, but also it gives us great, great hope for the future um, through all of these collaborative efforts. And may we continue to do this work, uh, this collaboration, learn alongside of one another feel inspired to educate and uplift within our own communities and communities around the world to do the work and to have a heavy um, and humble heart while we do it. And to always uh, think, think one another, um, reciprocate that, and then have a gratitude for all that we experience with. Eo, eo. Thank you, Mahina. Love you, Hans. Sending Hans off to bed, Hans and Mike. Aloha nui, guys. Yep, Hans has earned his rest along with Mike. They did a great job. Amazing shipmates, amazing archaeologists. Just so amazing to have their ikea, too, all of their knowledge um, as we dove down here so they could guide us through all of these um, shipwrecks that we were seeing, the story too. I mean, they painted a picture, they gave us all of that context as we were viewing what we saw. I mean, um, so they're so valuable. I mean, all of their ike, their mana'o, their thoughts, their knowledge. You know, I greatly appreciate it and I greatly appreciate them. So mahalo. Mm. 
Such good storytellers, yeah. Wonderful to have a guide that doesn't just uh, explain the steps or yeah. the facts or the details, but gives us the, all that kind of, mm -hmm. all the context, all the layers, um, the holistic understanding. Yeah. Uh, think about many of our great teachers back home in Hawaii, and mm -hmm. uh, they all they, they all have their own style. They all do it in their own way, but mm -hmm. uh, they invite us into that full context. I I know sometimes. Uh, Kapuna and Kumu will explain things to me and I won't understand, you know, they'll say, oh, look, my favorite color. And I'll be looking at what seems like a million different colors, but they'll just, uh, they can sort of see the whole picture and, and talk about it in ways that, that help us uh, help us understand uh, things and how they're connected, how they're related. Mm -hmm. uh, the reciprocal relationships they share with yeah. one another, the balanced relationships. We talked early in this expedition, Alamona, Alamona Kauli, about how the ocean and land have their, they have their pairs, they have mm -hmm. their, uh, their mirrors of each other, their reflections of one another. And, and I feel like um, great teachers help bring that out and Hans and Mike and, and all, of our, uh, all of our team, mm -hmm. especially the Alakai who were uh, on shore and, and helping just our viewers online, so many of you. Thank yeah. you so much for shaping that context and that kauna for us. Mahalo. Thank you for the thank you for those words. Um, so a few people who may have just tuned in, you have heard uh, some of our Kanako crew members on board are singing a Hawaiian mele, a song or an oli of gratitude. Um, it is to just thank all of what we have been given uh, by this realm, by this sacred realm of Po. Um, and Native Hawaiians, Kanako Iwi, we see this place as a pu'o honua, it's a sanctuary, and it's a place where we come from. The beginning of um, all of our genealogical chants are kumulipo. They start here in Po, in this place of darkness, in this area north of our Hawaiian islands. Um, it's Aina Kupuna, it's an elder islands. Geologically, they're older than our main Hawaiian islands that a few of us reside on, but We've been, on every ascent that we've been doing, uh, especially for these archeological dives, there's a great komaha, there's a heaviness that comes with this type of work in particular, just because of the tragedy and conflict uh, tied to these stories. So we've been offering a song of gratitude, um, just to thank one another, to thank all of the people who supported us through this expedition, through these dives, um, and to also just thank and remember and be grateful for all of the sacrifice that the servicemen and women in these places, they just gave everything um, to one another, to their crewmates, to their country. Uh, so we just wanted to sing Oli Mahalo to remember, remember them and remember their, their service, remember their sacrifice. So Mahalo, thank you. Mahalo. I want to extend. You, Mahina. Yeah, I'd like to extend that mahalo to. Uh, you know, it's so amazing to go into these depths and be able to shine a small bit of light. Um, so profound, such an intense experience. Um, but to to bring to that uh, the Kanaka Oivi understandings, the relationship to those to Uli, to this depths and layers of knowledge this library, this blue, great blue library that we can see. Of course, Atalanta and deserves some credit for shining the lights, but we have our own Mahinalani. We have our own heavenly moon. We have our own Kukui, our own light, <laughs> shining into this space and bringing us uh, as well as, as Malia and uh, really guiding um, guiding us into this space um, through the eyes and through the, through the na'au, through the aho of of uh, the Kanaka Oivi perspective, the Native Hawaiian perspective, and um, it's uh, it's really the only way you can understand this place or begin to understand this place. And so it's it's not only special, it's not only nice to have, but it's uh, fundamental, foundational. And so for for your all's presence, mm -hmm. for you uh, bringing protocol and oli and just uh, your your manawahini nature, uh, it means a lot to all of us. And, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing to see uh, anyone, but especially the young women of Hawaii, 
representing their island so well. And we know that those islands are in good hands. And we're so thankful for that. From Mahalo Nui to you. The back row, um, back row has been given uh, permissions uh, to uh, step out if we like, but, uh, you know, we love each other too much. I don't know. No, in all seriousness, uh, some of us may take a, some, some, uh, take a break. It has been an intense few days, but uh, our front row is mission critical. We love those guys. We love those gals. And, uh, you know, we want to hang out with them some more. And, who knows where we're going to end up in this blue water anyways. Oh, my goodness. Maine is like, come on, let me go to sleep. No, no, no. Oh, oh mahalo. It's always a privilege to be there. Thank you. Mahalo, Daniel. You <laughs> leaded us into some really amazing conversations. Uh, despite the heaviness of some of these dives, um, you know, sometimes when we're upon some of these wrecks, it just, the air in the room and the control valve felt so thick with sadness and heaviness and just tragedy. And it is necessary, I feel, to keep the morale of the crew in good spirits and high hopes. Um, and some of those conversations that you've guided us through, that you've led us through, have really helped um, me through this journey. So, mahalo, thank oh, you. Guaranteed, sis, any time. So now on the salsa lessons, Catalina is going to simultaneously yeah. navigate us while teach us how to salsa. Now that's yeah. some skill. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess if we can navigate these wrecks, I should probably be able to do that, right? You can do <laughs> <Most> it. definitely. <laughs> I don't know. In order to get some of us to do uh, salsa correctly, we probably need a heading and a, and a <laughs> link estimate. <laughs> You're gonna have to you're gonna have to speak salsa steps in uh, uh, to a bunch of scientists. I don't know. I mean, That's a bad luck, idea. Good, good luck with that. That's gonna be. I believe in y'all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that said, I do know a few uh, a few folks in academia who can actually dance. Yeah. Everybody's got their talents. Guarantee. Oh, Dr. Val, guess what instrument my daughter brought home from school today? <laughs> oh. Just take a guess. Trombone. Trombone. <laughs> yes. yes. I was like, oh, I'm gonna put you on. You're gonna do. You're gonna do zooms with Dr. Val. You guys are gonna jam out together. So she's all hyped up. You better. Is you better the slide get one longer up. than longer than she's tall? <laughs> it is basically about the same size as my daughter. She's 11. For those I, who are listening. I, I couldn't reach uh, all the way out when I first started playing. I was too small. <laughs> I love it. She's very excited. Yeah, she's ready for the marching band. It's a uh, great instrument. Not it's letting a lot her go fun. to Mardi Gras anytime soon, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, she's uh, she's excited. So I'm excited because she's excited, but yeah. Hopefully your neighbors are excited too. My neighbors are definitely not going to be excited, <laughs> but uh, I live in a, in a condominium complex, so I've got plenty of close neighbors. Uh, Same there'll here. Ha there'll have to be some strict rules as to what time, what times <laughs> of the day we can have trombone practice, but uh, <laughs> ah, it'll be a good time. It'll be a good time. Oh, man. Yeah, incredible and true feeling about you guys. Really do, uh, really do love this. This is, uh, this is too much fun, having too good of a time, uh, <laughs> even through the kamaha, even through the heaviness. Mm -hmm. Just uh, 
you guys bring a lot of joy and it's it's one of the things i believe uh we have to start uh educating ourselves and, and our communities and our children for is um in the midst of hard times um because i think there will be we will we will see hard times mm -hmm. uh, but in the midst of those hard times we we have to find joy have to find love have to live with aloha mm -hmm. and um and so yep yeah it's part of the journey got a salsa sometimes <laughs> <laughs> maybe our watch name should be the winch watch <laughs> the winch watch we've seen a lot of winch on our on our watch we do we do but the internet loves it they're all begging for it yeah. i know <laughs> Nope. It's almost as big a fan favorite as uh, the Headless Chicken Monsters. The Headless <laughs> Chicken mm -hmm. Monsters. How Although did I they get their name? <laughs> oh, well, they do look exactly like Headless I Chicken mean, Monsters. I mean, is that the common name, actually? <laughs> no, it is. I'm pretty sure it Come is. On. Oh, Come no on. way. I should be. If it's not, it should be. I didn't, I didn't think scientists were that funny, but I guess no, I'm No, we wrong. have our moments. We have our moments. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um... Yeah, that does seem to be the common name. Wow. That is awesome. <laughs> All right. I just thought it was like Nautilus slang, but now I know. <laughs> yeah, I keep it all purely scientific, clearly, <laughs> Amber. I'm always, always focused on the science. <laughs> I wow. mentioned before, sciences can have some pretty strange terminology, but it's 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 like this very uh particular thing that we're referring to when we say stuff like that <laughs> like headless chicken monsters yeah <laughs> don't you dare call another holothurian that's not a headless chicken monster a headless chicken <laughs> oh the outrage oh mm -hmm. i love it i love it <laughs> it's all part of the fun uh, everybody takes their own universe quite seriously we can't help it and uh <laughs> and that's what part of makes life great it's like i was saying earlier one of my favorite things is watching you know, people with deep knowledge just geek out on the things that they know the most about and love it. And it's, uh, I can't wait to get on these seamounts and just watch Dr. Val just uh, bubbling with excitement. And yes. It's going to be awesome. And yes. almost Dr. Virginia. And, yes. oh, all the life, for sure, for <laughs> sure. I love that. I think I just preemptively just manifested doctor for you the other day. I was like, that's Dr. Virginia. Almost done, yeah. Actually, this is funny. My um, my mom and she was listening, and she made a comment to me in a group chat. Oh, Dr. Beatty! Hey. Oh it's coming! It's yeah. coming! Oh, that's exciting. So much work goes into uh, advanced academic pursuits. Uh, PhDs are they're not just uh, selling them on the street these days. So uh, it's, <laughs> I don't I don't know. I I looked around one time to see if I could pick one up, and they, I couldn't find any for sale. But uh, you know what's funny is it's generally accepted that you have to have a PhD in order to award a PhD to someone else. Oh wow! So where did the first PhD come from? Oh, it's oh, all a scam. Yeah. It's all a scam. The I chicken knew or it. the egg. <laughs> yeah. I knew it. Who was that first PhD? I want to find that that guy. Guarantee it was a guy. Scammer. Yeah. Scammer. I don't know how many centuries do we have to go back? Yeah. And only and I, I only I can bestow PhDs. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Who is this guy? It's like guy needs to come to Hawaii. I actually have a feeling it, it evolved out of something more organic, but it's kind of goofy to think about. <laughs> oh. Oh, a lot of work. I, I have a lot of friends and so much respect for uh, their dedication and commitment uh, to completing those uh, degree programs, conducting that research, adding new knowledge to their fields. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very different than uh, just consuming the knowledge and, and processing the knowledge uh, in all of your pursuits up to that point. So it's uh, not the only way to advance your study and your learning, but it is a pretty impressive way. So kudos to those of you who are doctors and almost doctors super and and will be doctors there's it's uh several of them on board but, uh, yeah title aside everybody is everybody has their passion and their talent somewhere don't always find it right away but that's that's, true. that's really i think the thing that drives our perception of uh intelligence yeah. in some ways yeah i also give major props to those who uh you know, never found their way through school, but managed to uh, invent and engineer and uh, mm -hmm. and learn and study in, in the way that worked for them and yep. and gain all of their experience through uh, through real deep meaningful work as well that that matters to the world and 
that's uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, I love, I love you doctors, but I also have uh, such tremendous respect for those people who kind of earn their, earn their knowledge through the, um, through all these various, their various pathways that aren't ne necessarily credentialed in the same way, but deserve, mm -hmm. uh, deserve the same respect for sure. Yeah. I think kind of yeah. across the board though, um, you learn by doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There Guaranteed. are many different ways of doing. Mm hmm. Hey, well, I like that. Yeah. Oh, we are slowly making our way up. I don't know. I don't think uh, I don't think we're gonna make it up before. Uh, actually, I know we will not make it up yeah. uh, before our watch is over, and uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see if I can even make it to midnight. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people shaking their heads. Going, nope. If you keep talking, we're leaving mm -hmm. in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> Our front row crew uh, is uh, on the winch and on video and on navigation, and uh, they're in here no matter what um, during watch. They've, they've, uh, they are truly mission critical. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us in the back row, we just like them so much. We're continuing to pester them. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're keeping our friends SPL. company up in the front row. <coughs> Appreciate you. <laughs> still blows my mind that we're in the process of pulling in uh, well over five kilometers of a single cable. That's amazing. Yeah. When, you, when you're on the ocean, you don't, you can't see through. So uh, you have no real sense of just the bigness of the space that we're in right now. It is for me, one of the most frustrating things about being on the ship is not being able to jump around, jump into the ocean and swim in these uh, incredibly deep, incredibly blue, uh, incredibly profound waters. It's just, uh, you know, I don't want to set off the man overboard, man overboard mm -hmm. drill, but I really, really want to get, get in that water. It's, uh, mm -hmm. especially these last few days, it's been so calm and, oh. It's been remarkable, mm -hmm. given how this area is prone to having occasionally, uh, perhaps more than occasionally, uh, uh, wild weather. Maybe we can start a campaign, you know, a little, a little pressure campaign on Megan. I hope she's listening there in the, in the studio. I we don't think it's going to fly. Swim, call, swim, <laughs> call. Oh, she's ignoring me. She's, she's wise to my, to my <laughs> act. The closest we could probably get is Tepid Tub. Tepid Tub. <laughs> Absolutely. That would be, uh, it'd be I almost, been in that almost yet. the same. I know, we got to get in there. You guys are very sweet for hanging out, but please do not feel obligated. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we like it here. <laughs> You've been working hard, caring, in the conversation, and thank you. Yeah, but <laughs> front row's working hard right now. Back row's hardly working. That's that that describes most of the time in the control van, but uh, <laughs> but hey. Hey, don't tell them that secret. <laughs> <laughs> don't. don't. Oh, the internet knows. The internet knows. They know all. No, we appreciate we appreciate permission to leave, and and we'll even interpret it as a as a very kind and subtle hint to get the heck out of here. <laughs> but uh, but we probably won't listen because uh, we like we like to party with you guys. 
Blue water party. <laughs> I still can't believe that the Akagi gave us its name. That was yeah. incredible, huh? Yeah. Has anyone in the control van played the free online game World of Warships? No. Has anyone played this game? So I no, looked it. I looked it up. It yeah. kept oh. coming up whenever I was looking for some of these. Yeah. These vessels. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So when I was uh, just scrolling through the questions a couple of times, it's been referenced, and we have a, a viewer who just a few m minutes ago says. You know, it's been amazing to have these wrecks, which are ships represented in this game, World of Warships. I'm not much of a gamer, but uh, but now I'm curious. Maybe I'll ask some of the students I work with if they want to try this game out and see if I can learn a little bit more about uh, Akagi and, and Kaga and Yorktown uh, through their explorations. Oh, aloha, Norway. Got friends from Norway tuning in. We will have a nice day. You as well. I imagine it's uh, early morning in Norway. Beautiful maritime country. So much uh, marine heritage in Norway, uh, dating back all the way to, to the Vikings, some of the early, early explorers uh, of the Atlantic. And uh, yeah, love it. How's that cable look, Zach? Are we looking good? Oh, did you did you give me did you give me an answer? I couldn't hear it. Maybe muted. Oh, nope. SPL was off. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, uh, yeah, we just gotta slow it down every time we hit the sides. So, but it's going well. Good. 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 Ticking past 5,000 meters here shortly. Atlanta. Making our way off the seafloor, off of Kaga, coming back home to us on the surface. Thanks to everyone who's joining us in for the ride. Couldn't get enough here for the wreck, but stay for the Blue Water Show. <laughs> 8 to 12 watch. Oh, the gamers are alive and well on the internet. Subnautica? Subnautica? I've heard of that, but I mm -hmm. haven't played it. Yeah. It's supposed I, to be really good. I yeah. played it. It's oh. um, like an alien planet, underwater exploration kind of game. It's open world. What do you give? Five stars? Four stars? Three? Two? Uh, half a star? I give like four and a half stars. Ooh. Oh, uh, it's okay. a four that and a half stars enticing. from Zach. Okay. Mm. I, I like it. Ready. All right, might have to check this out. Oh, wow. I think that's our Norwegian friend yeah. diving, diving in the far north. Yeah, in the Lohitan Islands. And we're glad you're following us and appreciate you so much for tuning in and, and also loving the ocean up there where it's Cold. quite a bit colder. <laughs> yeah. yeah, quite a bit colder. Ooh, chilly. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. Mahalo for tuning in. Thank you. Now it makes me want to go to Norway. Yeah. Come on. Have you been? No. Uh, I have not. No. Yeah, I have neither. not. I want to do the fjords yeah. and uh, yeah, make it up to Svalbard and uh, hang out in Oslo and just, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. let's that go. That sounds great. Let's yeah. go. Turn the ship around. Catalina, tell the bridge. <laughs> yeah. New heading, Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing nobody listens to me on this ship. <laughs> they, they hear me, they don't listen to me. It's like my children. <laughs> so if our viewers uh, turn into channel three, you can look for the smiley face on the work deck. Find Aww, the smiley he face. Did that. <laughs>
Mm. So um, our uh, next dive is going mm -hmm. to be going back to the biology and geology of uh, some unexplored seamounts, uh, which is uh, going to be pretty exciting, I think, for all of us. Uh, but that uh, also means that uh, the engineers will be pretty busy over coming hours uh, uh, reconfiguring the uh, the two vehicles set up. So yeah, that's right. Atalanta uh, will be on the cable again as uh, as the tow sled, and then uh, Herc will be uh, swimming around on a leash in front of it. That's right. That's right. It's going to be amazing. I was uh, I went down last night during the eight to twelve watts. We weren't in the weren't in the water yet, and uh, got to got to sort of sit next to Catalina, look over her shoulder, and uh, and talk with Derek and learn a little bit about our, our mapping system, mm -hmm. a little bit from Rennie as well. And oh, it was great to see, actually, Catalina was processing some of the sonar data from the scan of the seamount that we'll be diving tomorrow, yesterday. Yeah, we had made a, a trek up there and, and gotten a good, pretty good high resolution map. And um, yeah, it looks, uh, I didn't see the dive plan yet. I don't think this, it had gone over to, to Rennie for that, but. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't cool. seen a dive plan yet either, but. We'll have one by tomorrow morning, probably. Yeah, yeah, exciting, exciting stuff. Lots to learn. It's one of the nice things is uh, there's always something to learn happening on board, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm especially excited by how we generate all of these maps and dive plans, and and that uh, was cool to watch uh, Catalina and, and Derek working on that last night. So yeah, mahalo, Catalina, for letting me mm -hmm. letting me learn. Anytime. Oh, we got Queensland, Australia, the Goldie. Oh man, are you on the Goldie? Oh, the waves. Mm -hmm. Love surfing down there in Queensland. Uh, so much fun. Water's a little bit warmer and uh, oh, long barrels. Yeah, absolutely. And the internet uh, is calling the smiley face deck frog, yeah. appropriately <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a good name for it. Name. Yeah, deck frog. I can see the resemblance there. Yeah. Other questions coming in about how long it takes to process uh, the data from an expedition like this. If you're, if you're referring to a single dive, I think really that data is going to live on for months as various uh, graduate uh, laboratories and research groups and NOAA and others um, kind of pour over some of that data and, and categorize, classify what they're seeing, um, answer some of their questions, generate new ones. Um, I think generally it takes kind of four to six months to get dive footage uh, available and released in a database that, that people can access. Uh, maybe Kukui knows better than me or maybe Dr. Val, but uh, how long does, Kukui, do you know how long the video data would take and uh, for that to kind of come out and be available for, for folks to see online? Dr. Val, I think you may know more. Uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> um, my guess is that we, because we process the data, we process the video, um, the, the still captures, we process and we separate, categorize the samples into their own folders and do the kind of the metadata on all the samples that we collect and we prepare them um, for the scientists on board and ashore to, to take home with them. Yeah. So I think it should be accessible after the expedition, but I could totally also be wrong. So the data, the data will be available, will be compiled and available by end of the expedition and then uh, scientists, researchers, agencies, uh, stakeholders will have that data to then continue to process and analyze further um, for, for several months. And I, I do think there's some processing time for, for the whole dive video, um, which many viewers ask about when they can see if they, they can get access to, for example, maybe they missed the USS Yorktown dive and would like to go back. Um, I think that has to be reviewed by NOAA and the Navy and other partners, the monument. Um, and uh, and once it's processed there, it uh, can get released uh, into a public database. Um, so yeah, that, I, I know that takes some time, but uh, yeah, it's amazing the work that happens just over the course of an expedition. 
by the science team, folks like Kukui, other data loggers, science managers, the lead scientists, the whole science team just processing massive amounts of data to, uh, and also the mapping team um, to hand over so that uh, we can continue uh, learning from this expedition well after the expedition ends. So, mm -hmm. And yeah. there's also um, a lab at UH Manoa who's uh, going to process um, a lot of the biological dives and geological dives and awesome. take the video frames um, to their lab and start annotating them. Yeah, so yeah. they're going to they're gonna log all that video footage and uh, characterize all of the things that they're seeing. All Every species that they can see in the video is going to be tagged and named. Uh, it's really remarkable. Um, Pretty right. soon, I think we'll have supports from, from AI, pro likely machine learning over the course of the next several years that are going to uh, speed some of that work up. But uh, it's a good practice for the, for the undergrads and graduate students as well, because they get a lot of practice IDing species. So. Especially the, with that giant hemichorellium forest we encountered a few <laughs> days ago. That was awesome. That's that was going to be a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And even, even with AI, um, people still have to train the model Got to train in order them. to use it, yeah. and the model still has to um, have some tweaks That's right. um, yeah. based on what they're surveying. So, yeah, annotations are always going to be needed, I feel like. Yeah. yeah, and an AI model is only as good as its training data set. That's mm. right. So, they call, uh, sometimes referred to in the programming world as garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> <laughs> So tra train your models carefully if you're going to go that route. <laughs> train. Developers, train your models carefully. I feel no, like this could be a song. Users, too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier said than done because there are a lot of intrinsic biases in uh, various applications so and stuff many. like that. And uh, that's, a, that's a tricky one to solve. But that said, I know we can do a lot better with them. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of uh, biases, I've learned in my computer science class that there is no learning without bias. So yeah, all these intrinsic biases are going to be, I feel like, inevitable to come by. And is learning how to mm. to dance across that line, yeah, to kind yeah. of find a more mm, optimal solution, I guess, as you're training your AI models. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, and back to the, the thing about um, you know, how long does it take to uh, uh, process out the data um, from these cruises. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, they're, they're, everything is pretty much done by the end of the cruise. So uh, getting everything wrapped up in those final days of the expedition is um, a, a little bit, uh, it, it can be a little bit uh, fast paced. A little hectic down there in the lab. Has, uh, just getting everything ready to go. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, from the uh, wet lab science portion, uh, bio takes care of those specimens uh, rather quickly. Um, so they, they process them the moment they come in uh, on the ROV. Uh, the rocks are a little bit more involved. It can take a couple of days because, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about preserving them or anything. But um, it does take time to find a window on the work deck to uh, cut the rocks open that we're not interfering with uh, any of the deck crew RV or the ROV ops, guys. Yeah. So um, uh, cut those open and then you have to wait for them to dry out. And then uh, we write up these full petrographic descriptions that will go back to the archives. Yeah. Uh, my first report I haven't delivered to the data lab yet. So that's that's on my to-do list for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah, no and that's yep. still just the beginning. Uh, Dr. Val will then uh, take those process samples back to her, back to their lab. There will be other labs that will receive some of the samples. I, I'm pretty sure, and uh, the analysis will uh, will uh, be conducted over probably the next couple of years um, as that yep. data is sort of further. You know, we we start gleaning more insights from that. Is that is that about right? Pretty much. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, I'm hoping we'll be moving a little faster now since the uh, past year, year and a half has been a little bit uh, harried for a few reasons. So uh, yeah. we're kind of settling back in and uh, uh, starting to process some of those samples through much faster now. Some more rock time. Some yep. more rock time for Dr. Val. Yeah, and Excellent. I worked I worked together with a team of talented geochronologists, uh, uh, some of whom have sailed on the ship uh, before or... Uh, even uh, with us on the current expedition with uh, uh, Hannah, our, uh, yeah. nice. our uh, other geologist aboard. Um, no. 
awesome. one of three of us aboard. So, because mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Wagner is also a geologist. So, uh, yeah, I, I uh, my biggest uh, uh, determinant of pacing my kind of sample work is if, when I'm working with the geochronology team. Uh, they need a little time to uh, prep uh, some of the subsamples that they receive from cruises like this and determine whether they're uh, appropriate for um, uh, de determining, determining an argon-argon age. And uh, once I get that list of samples that look promising for that uh, from my collaborators, uh, then I, I pick out a subset of those samples and uh, uh, do a bunch of other isotope work on them. Oh, amazing. So. Amazing. Hope, hoping that timeline will uh, stick around a year, but you know, if it doesn't, we make do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things happen, and uh, you know, so do the delays every now and again. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah, good. That's, Always that's good to be flexible. It's the way science goes. But I'm really excited to see what all we learn about the rocks that we're mm -hmm. starting to bring on board. We've learned a little bit in the last few months, but uh, not quite enough yet. Yeah, always so, more. Keep yeah, learning. We're, we're still in the midst of uh, some uh, a lot of data collection on uh, some uh, Nautilus samples from previous expeditions. So 138 and 140, oh, that 134 have given us some good rocks from this area. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Isotopes tell stories. Mm -hmm. Isotopes tell stories. And. Yeah, Sounds like a book stories. of poetry, actually. <laughs> yes, it, you, know, you can get part of the picture from just looking at the hand sample, but you can't see what its isotopic composition is. So we have instruments and some chemical procedures that help us out with that. If you ever want to write, uh, if you ever want to write a book of poetry called Isotope Stories, <laughs> I would <laughs> gladly co-author that book of poetry with you. I don't, that's not really much of an offer. I'm not really a very good poet, but hey. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of thinking It'd the same fun. thing. I'm like, hmm. It'd be fun. It's an interesting idea. I, I don't know if I could pull it off. We can put it to some trombone music. Oh, God. <laughs> some jazz. Oh, it would be great. I'd need a few months to get my chops back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got time. I haven't played in a few, in a few years. <laughs> we got time. I'll get it started. Isotopes, I'm going to put on my notes right now. <laughs> Isotope stories coming to you, coming to uh, your nearest local bookstore. <laughs> Uh, yeah, probably in about 20 years. Can't really do a lot of the trombone thing living in an apartment. So. Yeah. I've got neighbors on all sides, almost. That's like a side hustle. That doesn't have to be the doesn't have <laughs> to be the main thing. Yeah. Okay, everyone. I think I'm gonna ow ow and hear moi. Ahui ho. That means pass out. Yeah. That means pass out. That means to, shower uh, and pass out. Oh no. My gosh. Um, and until we meet again. Oh, awesome. <laughs> but I really, I am really grateful for all of you. Amber, Zach, Robert, Catalina, Dr. Val, Kukui, Dan, Virginia, and even our two um, honorary guests, <laughs> Mike and Hans, who are here with us. And for all of our viewers out there, all of our partners, all of our scientists and support ashore, our expedition leads, our alaka'i, Megan uh, Cook and Daniel Wagner, and it's just been a pleasure and an honor to witness, you know, everything that we've seen over the past three days, three to four days, and just taking it all in. And I know that, I mean, it's been a lot to digest. And I think later when we kind of go back to our homes, go back to our families, go back to our communities, uh, we'll be able to piece together some of these lessons and stories and all of the ike, the knowledge from one another. Um, a little more cohesively. So thank you so much. Um, and ahui ho. Ahui ho. Mahalo no Mahalo. Get some good rest. I think I may uh, go heal boy too. But yeah, thank you guys so much again uh, for everything and for, yeah, all the support and the love and the knowledge that you share and getting us around the shipwreck safely, navigating us and capturing these beautiful video images with such clarity. Thank you all so much. And for all of um, the people ashore, thank you for also sharing your stories and your ike with us. Yeah, so mahalo nui oku. And uh, also mahalo to Megan and Daniel as well um, for their leadership and expertise as well. Yeah, mahalo nui guys. Mahalo nui Thank you. Good night.
Oh, they go to bed and they miss the invitation to do an archaeological diving training in the Azores with our uh, mm -hmm. online viewer and new best friend, Gonzalo. Mm -hmm. Gonzalo in Portugal. Oh, nice to, nice to be. That's incredible invited. Starting this Sunday, a week of training. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're all invited. All right, new heading, Portugal, then Norway. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Catch that, Catalina. <laughs> 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 Catalina's learned already. <laughs> Ignore this crazy guy. <laughs> oh, Just man, wait. back row is dropping like flies. Yeah, Dr. Val, it's you and I. It's, uh, yep. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you <know>? front row. <laughs> so, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's why Robert left again. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I don't well, blame he, him. He probably went to go get coffee again or something. <laughs> it's an awful long coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> Probably needs it. That might be him. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was some tricky maneuvering today. Yeah, yeah there certainly were a, a couple of interesting moments where uh, some of the instruments on Atalanta were not really responding or behaving normally, and our ROV pilots and navigator uh, had to do some awesome troubleshooting, keeping Atalanta safe, making sure nothing uh nothing dangerous was happening and uh it turned out we were okay they they got that that problem fixed and did an awesome job of taking us along the cargo and and uh bringing that to life for us so amazing mm -hmm. i am very excited to get back to seeing the all the little sea creatures and the good oh, geology. Me too. Yeah, even the rocks, even the <laughs> rocks. Can't have the life, can't have the biology without the geology. So yeah, it's gonna be gonna be fun. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we'll be right at it again. Uh, stay tuned. If you're watching us at, uh, on Nautilus Live or YouTube, we should be back in the water. Uh, my understanding is sometime late tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. um, Possibly a little bit early tomorrow afternoon, and I think 4 p.m. Uh, was, was 4 p.m. I think. All right. Hey, let's go. Let's go. All right. Robert has re-entered yes. the control van. In the building. Yep. We have starting at ROV Pilots. Robert Waters. His headset's <laughs> not on internet. He can't hear me, so don't get too excited. But uh, such a joy. Work with Robert and Zach, our ROV pilot team, doing such an outstanding job. And not asking for any praise or any credit. Just want to get their jobs done well and uh, take care of these ROVs. And such humble guys. And real, real privilege and pleasure to get to know them and see them do their work. my headset around over here. All right, Val, I'm serious. Uh, Isotope stories, I think uh, it's at least an epic poem. I don't know if might be in a collection of other epic poems, but... Uh, I don't know, how many acronyms can I throw into something like that? Oh, we can definitely, acronyms are great <laughs> for poetry. It's outstanding. Geology kind of loves, uh, especially geochemistry, it loves acronyms probably a little too much. So... But, uh, sometimes it's like a little bit of a different dialect. Yeah, most of the sciences, they uh, kind of create their own little internal languages. <laughs> and uh, it just makes it more fun, I think, trying to decipher what the heck they're talking about. Um, you know, it, it can be thought of to exclude, but it's really just an opportunity to play, you know, a little bit of a word puzzle game. And uh, yeah, I get a kick out of it. 
Good, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, like, you know, I know a lot of people hear the word geologist and they think like mining or oil, but there's, there's a whole very broad spanning uh, research world to that too. And we have a geologist who specialize into like geophysics or geodynamics. Um, and, uh, that, that helps us figure out how uh, the interior of the earth is structured. Uh, you know, how it's convecting and uh, moving material around inside the solid mantle. And, you know, ver various flavors of, uh, 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 you know, various flavors of uh, those disciplines within themselves even, so. Yeah. Yeah, like geochemistry too. You know, I, I specialize in high temperature uh, sorts of work, so I, I like lavas a lot. Um, uh, yes. And the mantle's pretty cool too. I've done some work on some uh, bits of uh, uh, like lithosphere and or uh, uppermost mantle that gets scraped onto uh, continents under certain settings. Yeah. It was a little bit harder to interpret, but um, they still tell some pretty cool stories. I and bet. I'm, I bet. But it's it's the uh, the mantle plume and the like the marine geology stuff that. Uh, uh, I, I really, really love to do. It's you know, just, it's, it's just so understudied in some spots and so overstudied in some others. And you know, there's there's a lot we're still learning there. I mean, I the like way we're just getting started. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I love it. I, I, the way I think about it, and and you've helped me think about it this way, is uh, you know, it's just it's just earth making. It's yeah. just planet making, and and understanding what it's made of, how it's made. Um, and earth making is this incredibly beautiful art uh, that's taken place over, you know, over four billion years. Uh, and it's uh, this process, you know, I think we need to think on those time scales. And I think we need to think about how our planet has formed and how it continues to be formed and what it's made of. Mm -hmm. We need to have that kind of intimate relationship um, uh, with, with planet ocean, with planet earth. And, uh, <laughs> And that's what I, you know, so when I, now when I think about what you study, when I think about geology, when I think about isotopes, when I think about isotope stories and the amazing book of poetry that we're going to write, uh, I think about a story of earth making, you know, and it's really, uh, to it's me, really that's incredibly is. beautiful, incredibly beautiful. And I, I hope the world uh, comes to understand and be invited into that kind of relationship with our planet that they, uh, that they can fall in love with these processes carried out over millions tens of millions hundreds of millions billions of years that have brought us to where we are it's uh the same way that the hawaiians think of uh, the islands that we are moving through now and these waters as our ancestral islands um that whole the earth making is the ultimate work of the ancestors yeah it is uh it really is that is uh, such a such a especially when we can bring this sort of holistic understanding to it and and weave our sort of uh our right and left, I know this is not, uh, I know our brain does not actually operate in such divisions across hemispheres, but um, the sort of right brain, left left brain way of looking at uh, the process and think about it in interdisciplinary, holistic ways. Um, I think Isotope Stories is going to uh, gonna change the world. I'm predicting it, <laughs> number one bestseller. That's my prediction. We're going to get contributions from uh, everyone, including Robert Waters, especially since he's <laughs> not listening to us at the moment. And, uh, and uh, there's going to be some great, great insights in there. We don't know what they are yet, or at least I don't. Val might, but mm, uh, debatable. Uh, it's going to be fun. As, as we were saying earlier, um, you hit a certain point in your education where you have a pretty good idea of what you don't know, as well yeah. as not knowing some things that you don't know. Yeah. So it's it's not just about how much you know. It's the the capacity for you know more knowledge to be generated that you start to become aware of. Yeah. 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 That's what we're doing with this expedition and what all of Nautilus's expeditions are doing. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a pretty cool place. And sometimes I like to think about it in kind of that more abstract way, you know, we evolved from this planet and are continuing to evolve. And uh, 
we're basically the planet trying to understand itself. <laughs> it is beautiful as well, yeah. Oh, poor planet. <laughs> Got stuck inside our heads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We well, didn't, we didn't mean to torment anyway, you. Because we're made out of that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to torment you, Mother. But uh, isn't that just how it goes? Oh, man. No, I love it. It's, uh, wow. I'm getting more and more excited about this poem. meters at this point it's one kilometer yeah. still at 4.4 kilometers to go making good time it just still blows my mind and you know places like the deep abyssal plains are really not very well studied at all um, you know it's part part of a uh, out of necessity because there's not always um, a whole lot to explore there with, you know, um, uh, with uh, the thick sediments. I, I could be wrong about this because I'm not a sediment person uh, normally, but uh, I, I know that there have been some gravity cores and stuff done in the ocean basins throughout the world, but I, I don't know how much footage there there is from some of the more extreme depths, like uh, like with the deep dives we've been doing the last uh, three or four days. Yeah, no, yeah. someone needs to invent uh some funny ocean floor scanning robot to just start cruising the abyssal plains of the ocean and uh i think hui might have one of those come on I, I know i know they have a mesobot but i don't know what it's uh i don't know what its depth depth uh, certification is yeah i think it is sort of explicitly designed for some it's of that like midwater yeah yeah so uh but I mean, hey we can get some information out of like sub, bo sub bottom profiling, which uh, the yep. ship is capable of doing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it's uh, kind of indirect. Like this, this week was my first time ever seeing uh, the abyssal plane. Yeah. Yeah. Usually I'm uh, up on the sea mounts. Yeah, that was, uh, oh good. I'm glad you got that new experience. Yeah. It's all pretty much new to me. I haven't, uh, you know, the deep sea is, always been a place I felt, but never been a place that uh, I've traveled into or studied carefully. I, uh, in my biomimicry studies, we do a little bit of looking at deep sea organisms, but kind of removed from their landscape because they have so many incredible adaptations. So they're really exciting to study. Mm -hmm. um, but what I love about being down there and seeing the context that they're living in, it sort of offers uh, a more, a, a deeper picture, more context of what, what these adaptations are, why we see them and Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, most of those organisms are on sea mounts, not on the abyssal plain. We don't, we don't uh, find much evidence for macro scale life, I think, on the abyssal plain. Just not enough food. And but places to colonize, too. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's where these wrecks uh, yeah. are kind of giving, giving life a chance it wouldn't have otherwise had in this area. Because, you know, as tragic as uh, uh, this battle was, and, you know, all of all of World War II for that matter. Um, it is an opportunity to bring uh, a, a place on the seafloor where a, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, organisms can survive and from what we're seeing thrive. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there is a question came in from a viewer wondering if those ships take long enough to, uh, to sort of break down and corrode that, um, that you might be able to start seeing some ferromanganese crust developing on those shipwrecks. Is, and I know that's, a, that's something that happens over a long time span, but, and there's some debate over how long these ships will, uh, will last down there in the depths over 5,000 meters. But one of our viewers, curious to know. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, on average, ferromanganese crusts are expected to grow on the scale of like a couple of millimeters every million years or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I honestly have no idea if that's like a like a constant growth rate or if it's episodic or not. 
Um, that would be a good question to send off to some of our manganese crust colleagues at USGS. Uh, but yeah, they're very slow growing. Um, I don't think it would be anything we would be able to see in our lifetimes. Yeah. And that I wasn't sense. seeing evidence for a lot of manganese uh, nodules uh, on the abyssal plane. Abyssal but plane we only either, saw yeah. such a small part of it. And a lot of those sediments had been churned up by uh, uh, the wrecks impacting uh, that, that uh, silty sedimentary bottom. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I don't have a good answer for that one, but uh, it's slow. It's very slow. And uh, I don't think we would uh, see much of that uh, until well far into the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that ship's probably not going to make it long enough. If probably that, not. If it'll it'll stuff. be pretty much gone by then, would be my guess. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there is one question in the chat that I can see about why do geologists r lick rocks? <laughs> well, um that does work as a good identification tool if uh, you're trying to determine if something is halite, aka sodium chloride, which is our table salt. Um, sometimes that gives you some textural information that can help, uh, you know, kind of help you uh, uh, decide what sort of sedimentary rock you're looking at, like a like a fine siltstone versus a like a shale or slate or something, and. Uh, Yeah, bone kind of, uh, you can identify bone that way too, but I'm not the kind of person who goes sticking bones in my mouth if I can help it. <laughs> but I know a couple of uh, like uh, anthropology types who will use that technique to identify bone. It just has a very distinct uh, texture. Amazing. So, um, yeah, geology literally does use all five senses. Because <laughs> you, can, you can tell sometimes certain rock types by um, how they sound when you hit them with a hammer. Oh. So, um, yeah, there's a, uh, an igneous rock type, uh, sort of a funny, somewhat rare uh, composition called a phonolite. And it's called a phonolite because uh, when you hit it with a hammer or another metal object, it rings, sort of like a bell. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. A bell. I like it. <laughs> You know, and like when I'm cutting rocks on the saw, you you can uh, you can kind of feel just by uh, the way the uh, uh, the way the saw blade cuts through it, whether or not it's uh, heavily altered or if it's uh, been pretty well preserved. So the more altered you get a rock, the the softer it is, and the easier it is to uh, slice open on the saw. But um, uh, you know, well preserved uh, basalts off of some of these seamounts. You know, the, the sound changes a little bit as the as it's cutting through this well-preserved, still fairly fresh rock. And it'll it'll take more time to cut through because it's just more resistant, more intact, and more representative of its uh, uh, primary state. Like the, the state that it's in at the time it erupted and cooled on the seafloor before any major alteration may have happened. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's a, you can learn a lot about a rock just by kind of paying attention to what it does or what it sounds like or how it feels while you're uh, processing it. And uh, that helps us uh, in the field with uh, identifying um, which rocks might be high priority targets uh, for geochemical work. Because we don't know until uh, we get these on board because especially around here with these Cretaceous rocks, a lot of them are covered in pretty thick ferromanganese rinds. So. Right. Yeah, we have to make a few educated guesses, uh, if you will, on uh, like what to pick up, uh, what kind of shape we might be looking for, approximate size. Yeah, it's a uh, you know, there's a little bit of a uh, predictive geology happening there uh, to try to get um, the best possible samples without just like grabbing everything off the seafloor, and the permit wouldn't allow that anyway. So yeah, um, yeah we we try to be very. Uh, careful with what we're picking up here and get the best chance we can at getting, uh, you know, getting a rock that's a storyteller. A rock that's a storyteller. Yeah. Oh boy, isotope stories, here we go. Geochemistry stories in general, too. Sometimes there I uh, put together the, all the, um, 
the bulk major and trace element compositions of these rocks as well as the isotopes because that's where you get you know a, a diverse array of all of these uh, different different uh, numbers you know compositions uh, ratios that you can get a look at in a rock uh, the more you understand it in its geological setting so it can be a lot to think about sometimes but um, it, it it's pretty rewarding for what you're able for the kind of information you're able to pull out of a rock that way that is amazing yeah I love it all those stories. And then sometimes I go plug those into tectonic models and uh, <clears throat> see what they match up with as far as, uh, you know, hot spots or, uh, you know, any other tectonic features that have uh, shifted over time as the plate moves, uh, as the Pacific plate moves uh, uh, currently kind of northwestish, but, um, you know, it gives us an idea of, of what uh, happens you know, 50 or 80 or 120 million years ago versus, uh, you know, what, what that anomalous little bit of mantle is melting today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh. so, a lot of little it. detail things that lead into this just grandiose big picture thing where you're kind of looking at the whole planet. It's really cool. It is really cool. And I'm excited to keep learning more about it over the next couple of weeks. Totally. This is going to be fun. We have some beautiful rocks drying out in the lab right now. Although I'm going to have to process those out soon so we have room to... Uh, for the new ones. To, for, the, for the new ones we're expecting. All right. Move over, old rocks. Yep. That's a good thing, though. Well, I gotta say, geochemistry isn't always beautiful. Um, it's it's not an uncommon issue to have something randomly start flooding in the lab, <laughs> and then you gotta go clean it up. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh no! Because we we for isotope work, um, we have to keep our labs pretty clean, which means uh, pretty high rates of air exchanges. Um, you know, trying to keep as little metal or cardboard in those as possible because you know metal things will corrode in an acidic environment like we have in uh, isotope clean rooms um, uh, and, and particulate from you know corroded metal can get into the air and then it eventually gets in your samples and then uh, and yeah that's that's never any that's never a good thing never uh, a good thing <laughs> Yeah, take we're, care of those samples. we're sticklers about cross-contamination in the lab. I bet. Uh, yeah. I bet. The no. science is uh, only good if it's uh, as precise as it can be, and otherwise we... Uh, garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, <laughs> garbage out. It's <laughs> generally a good rule. Yep. Uh, applies to our diets as well. Oh, yeah. Well, fortunately, eating pretty well here on the ship. Oh, I'm happy. Doing my best. It's good. I am. Uh, I'm gonna run and grab coffee. anybody okay. else Anybody else want some? Everybody's good. All right. I'll be right back. Don't want to miss the excitement of the blue water. <laughs> Don't let anything happen while I'm gone. Actually, we can we just come off the winch. We'll just stay right here. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Just kidding. But I'll be back soon. Aloha. You know, that tells me that uh, Dan is uh, an official member of the Winch fan club. <laughs> Seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> we all are.
coming up on 4100 so about 1.3 kilometers of cable pulled in about 4.1 to go